Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Jared. I'm going to introduce Dr. Kwame. Um, Dr. Kwame is a fourth year resident in the University of Washington Boise Psychiatry Residency Program. He earned his bachelor's degree in biology from Pacific Lutheran University and attended St. Louis University for medical school. So welcome, Dr. Kwame. All right. Thanks, Dr. Maybe. Um, all right. Uh, so welcome, everyone, to my Grand Rounds presentation. Um, thanks for, thanks for uh, being here. I'm excited to present about artificial intelligence and psychiatry. Um, I have no financial disclosures, and I'll start by giving you an outline of what I'm going to cover today. So I'm going to begin with an introduction to AI, go over some, um, get us on the same page about some recent developments in AI, and introduce some important AI terminology and concepts. And then I'll move on to an overview of applications of AI in medicine. And then the heart of the talk will be on applications of AI in psychiatry, of course. Um, and then I'll close with uh, an overview of some challenges of using AI tools in psychiatry. So disclaimer here, I am not, and I, I don't have any formal training or background in artificial intelligence. Um, so if anyone does in the audience, please speak up at the end and add anything you think might be relevant. Um, but I am interested in technology, and you've probably probably noticed that AI is increasingly in the news lately, um, helping solve increasingly complex scientific problems, beating humans at increasingly complex games. And then there's this talk of AI systems possibly replacing various jobs, including psychiatri psychiatrists' jobs. So it seems like a really important area, and I wanted to learn more about it. And then 2022 was a really big year for AI. It was the year that these text-to-image generators went, went mainstream, these systems where you can input some text and then get a series of images from this AI uh, system that have never existed before. Um, and these images can get really impressive and interesting, like this one on the right uh, that won a first prize at the Colorado State Fair. And then 2022 is also the year that a Google engineer was fired after claiming that a language model was sentient and becoming concerned about this. And it was the year that the public got a taste of these large language models when ChatGPT was released by OpenAI in November. And I thought ChatGPT deserved its own slide because it generated so much buzz and excitement and uh, seems like such an important uh, development. So ChatGPT is this AI program that was trained on a huge body of text in order to predict the most likely next word in a sequence, given the previous sequence of words that it's been shown. Um, so it's a generative, it generates a sequence of words based on its pre-training, and it does this generation via a transformer, which is a type of neural network, and I'll be talking more about what neural networks are in a minute. So it's important to remember that ChatGPT doesn't have any understanding of what it's outputting and will make things up, it will confabulate things, um, because it's just generating words on, on this probabilistic basis. Um, and it's important to remember that because it generates really plausible sounding responses for almost any prompt you can think of. Um, and people are really only limited here by their creativity and prompt engineering is something that people have been talking about. So it can write code as like a skill that people will want to cultivate in the future. So it can write code, translate languages, write passing college essays, and even pass the USMLE and bar exams. And I've had a lot of fun playing around with it, including asking it to write this series of haikus about applications of AI and psychiatry, which I thought turned out pretty nice, actually. Um, so those are some recent developments in AI to be aware of, um, but taking a step back, um, what are we talking about when we talk about artificial intelligence? So AI is defined as the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. And then a really important subset of AI is machine learning, uh, which is famously defined as the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And what AI and machine learning really boil down to is statistics. These are statistical tools on a lot of steroids. Uh, so you can think of them as really advanced statistical tools. And perhaps no AI tool is more, um, more advanced than deep learning, which underpins a lot of the most exciting things that are happening in AI these days, including ChatGPT. So deep learning is this subset of machine learning it involves training artificial neural networks on a large data set. And neural networks are called neural 
because their architecture was inspired by the human brain, where you have nodes that are interconnected with other nodes and these nodes contain information, just as neurons contain information and are interconnected with other neurons in the human brain. And these artificial neural networks have a, an input layer, um, hidden layers in the middle, and then an output layer at the end where it gives you a determination of some kind based on the associations um, that have been made in the hidden layer. Um, and this can do really powerful things, um, but it does have some drawbacks. One drawback is this black box problem, which is that what happens in those hidden layers really is hidden. Um, and it can be difficult to understand how a neural network arrives at the determination the decision it does arrive at. Uh, so these systems have poor explainability, and this can be relevant in medicine and in psychiatry because if you can't explain how your, say, model for predicting suicide arrived at its decision, it can be hard to know how to apply that clinically. And then these deep learning systems also have the drawbacks of requiring a lot of computer power, um, and so they're really expensive, really time consuming, and really energy intensive to run, and people have raised concerns about the environmental impact of these systems. And then for purposes of today's talk, there are two basic types of machine learning to be familiar with. One is supervised learning, where you train a model on labeled data. Um, so I hope you can see my cursor here. In this example, we have labeled pictures of apples, labeled pictures of strawberries. And these pictures constitute our training set that we're gonna feed into a machine learning model. And our hope is that if the model sees enough of these uh, labeled, um, data, it's going to be able to make accurate predictions on new unseen examples by picking up the signal for an apple and the signal for a strawberry. And this is useful for a lot of things in, um, in the AI space, probably most relevant for us today being uh, predictive modeling. So um, being able to more accurately classify things we already know the, the labels for. And then there's unsupervised learning, which uh, involves training a model on unlabeled data with the goal of discovering new patterns or relationships in the data. And this is helpful when the underlying classes are poorly defined and when defining those classes is difficult for human, human brains to accomplish. And maybe the computer can pick up patterns that might not be, be clear to us. Um, so in this example, we have unlabeled pictures of apples and strawberries. We feed them into our model and then it clusters them based on similarity. So two types of machine learning to be familiar with. And then the last bit of AI terminology to, to know is overfitting. Um, and overfitting is when your model fits the data it's trained on. So like those apples and strawberry pictures, um, it fits the training data too closely, which is actually a problem because it causes it to perform poorly with new data in the real world. So these neural network systems are so powerful that they can model the data they're trained on pretty much exactly. Um, and this can actually be a problem if that means that they're picking up a lot of this uh, kind of noise in the data instead of the signal in the data. Um, and this overfitting can occur when you train a, a model on a sample size that's too small, you have too little training data, or if your model is too complex or trains for too long on the data. So it's really important that these models, these predictive models are externally validated on a set of data that they were not trained on to see if they actually did pick up the, a signal in the data that will uh, be useful in the real world. Um, so external validation is really important. So that's a brief introduction to some recent developments in AI and some AI terminology and concepts. And now to a, an overview of some applications of AI in medicine. So the dream of AI in medicine is that we'll have this super intelligent assistant, which will make us better at doing everything. Um, you know, there's hope that AI systems could enhance our ability to, to diagnose various conditions, allow us to see into the future in certain ways, enhancing our ability to make prognoses and assess risk and predict who's going to respond to a treatment and so provide precision treatment. Um, there's also this dream that AI systems could provide a, better clinical decision support than we have right now, where you could ask them a very specific question about your very specific situation, and it provides you with a tailor, an answer tailored just for you. Um, and then there's the dream that AI could help automate administrative tasks and save us um, a lot of the things that um, cause the most headaches um, in, in healthcare. And then maybe counterintuitively, there's this hope that AI could help enhance the human touch in healthcare. 
This idea is articulated by Dr. Eric Topol in his recent book, Deep Medicine, where he says maybe AI will make emotional intelligence the most important thing for future doctors by democratizing some of the root memorization kind of knowledge diagnostic skill uh, stuff. So that's the dream, but we're clearly not there yet. As of, as of today, like a pop-up reminding, notifying you of a possible drug, drug interaction or using up-to-date as a clinical decision support is probably the closest you've gotten to having a computer really help you out. But there are more and more of these uh, dreams being realized in various ways. So the dream of having these clinical prediction models that will enhance our ability to diagnose and see into the future in various ways um, is uh, starting to become more of a reality in various uh, fields of medicine um, with new studies coming out all the time, including like neural networks to accurately classify skin cancer images, improve cardiovascular risk prediction, detect eye diseases from retinal images, et cetera. And then this dream of having an AI system you can turn to for clinical decision support that can provide you with tailored um, recommendations. Um, um, so a little bit more powerful than looking it up to date and like having to sift through articles. It can provide you with tailored rec uh, recommendations um, is starting to manifest uh, a little bit. And uh, things are moving so quickly in this area that I had to update my first bullet point here because large language models like ChatGPT are being incorporated in, into search engines now, as Microsoft recently announced that they're using a next generation ChatGPT in their Bing search engine. Um, and there's this idea floating out there that if a clinical decision support system like this, if a future large language model um, becomes smarter than the smartest doctor or lawyer you can find, why would you need to consult a professional? Um, it's like, why have this this middleman in the relationship and why can't the patients just go directly to the professional? So this idea is espoused by some pretty influential people like uh, technology entrepreneur, Balaji Srinivasan. But uh, where are we in reality uh, right now? Um, well, some Google researchers just last year developed a large language model, which they tailored to answering medical questions. And it was able to answer medical questions with quite high accuracy compared with clinicians. Um, but it had some significant limitations. It uh, had much more inappropriate or incorrect content in its answers, it was missing, missing quite a bit more important information and had a bit more potential for harm if the answers were used clinically. Uh, so, you know, I think it's important to keep these limitations of these systems in mind and uh, um, think about how something that confabulates, that makes things up, um, could be a big problem um, if you're using it for high stakes decision making, like medical decision making. Um, so if someone solves that problem, that'll, that'll be a big deal. And then ChatGPT is starting to realize this dream of having an AI system that helps with administrative tasks. So late last year, Kung and others um, reported that clinicians at a pulmonary clinic had a 33% decrease in time spent completing documentation and indirect patient care tasks by using ChatGPT. They had to compose appeal letters to insurance companies, simplify records for patients, and even help brainstorm challenging cases um, to uh, get that decrease in, in time. Um, and I found this neat example on Twitter where a doctor asks ChatGPT to write a letter to a, an insurance company asking them to approve an echocardiogram and gets this result in a matter of seconds. I think quite a professional looking letter in a matter of seconds compared to the you know, at least five, 10 minutes, this, this might have taken otherwise. Um, caveat though, that you would definitely want to proofread this and check the references. Um, people, people on Twitter pointed out that both of these references were confabulated. So, so definitely want to check on that if you try using this. So that is an overview of some applications of AI in medicine and now on to AI in psychiatry. So there are a lot of potential applications of AI in psychiatry. One is these clinical prediction models improving our ability to diagnose and see into the future in various ways. And then there are applications of AI in psychotherapy. There's emotion AI, which is looking at facial expressions, tone of voice, et cetera, to gain insights into, um, into emotions. And then there's this hope that through that unsupervised learning I talked about uh, a few minutes ago, um, where you cluster things based on their similarity, that AI systems could help us recognize patterns that humans can't recognize 
and thereby improve our nosology of psychiatric disorders, incorporating improved insights into biological mechanisms that might be at play that humans might not be able to recognize. So those are a lot of applications, um, and I'm not going to have time to cover all of them today. Instead, I'm going to focus on two that were particularly interesting to me, those being clinical prediction models and uh, some applications in psychotherapy. So uh, before we get into some actual examples of clinical prediction models in psychiatry, I wanted to introduce a framework for thinking about what to look for um, with these studies. Um, so the first thing you'll want to be familiar with in looking at these studies is this metric called area under the curve, which is a very commonly used measure of model performance, which is a rating of true positive rate of your classifier of your clinical prediction model versus false positive rate. And a perfect classifier would have a 100% true positive rate and a 0% false positive rate, right? So upper left corner would be your, your perfect classifier. And, and so you want your area under the curve to be as large as possible in order to as, get as close as you can to that uh, perfect classifier. And some benchmarks to be familiar with are that an area under the curve of 0.7 to 0.8 is considered acceptable classification performance, and then 0.8 or greater is considered excellent classification performance. So uh, things to keep in mind as we look at these studies. Um, the challenge is that it can be difficult to know how the area under the curve that's reported was arrived at. Like what was the quality of the underlying methodology that was used to arrive at that uh, model's performance? And it's difficult to appraise the quality of the underlying methodology since these are really advanced statistical tools, right? Um, it's really complex. And even if you do have a background in statistics, uh, standard statistical, statistical methods and rules of thumb for like what your end needs to be don't apply. So you really need specialized knowledge to be able to do a deep appraisal of these kinds of studies. Um, and that's unfortunate because uh, this 2022 systematic review of these models that I looked at found that almost 95% of them had high risk of bias. Um, so, you know, if we're unable to appraise them, kind of have to take them at face value, uh, but most of them have a high risk of bias. So like, what are we to do? Well, I think the thing that we can do or that I can do as someone without a background in machine learning is look for external validation. Um, because if the model does perform well out in a new set of data, like out in a, like a real world set of data that it hasn't been trained on, I think that's a pretty good indicator that, it, that the underlying methodology was probably sound. Um, so look for external validation in these studies. Um, and, uh, and that's important because not all the studies do external validation. In fact, most of them don't. This systematic review found only one-fifth of models underwent external validation. And it found that almost 90% of models had insufficiently rigorous internal validation to alleviate overfitting. And internal validation is really complex, but you can basically think of it I think as setting aside some of your training data, so you have this bit of data you wanna train your model on, you set aside a chunk of it, and then you say, I'm gonna train my model on the rest of the data. And then once I'm done training my model, I'm going to test its performance on that bit of data I've, I've set aside. Um, so a bit of a depressing systematic review here, but gives us a framework for some things to look at. So diving into a few of these clinical prediction models. So one uh, that I found uh, that I thought was of uh, pretty high quality was this 2020 study by Raquette and others in the Lancet Digital Health, where they developed a model for predicting first episode psychosis one year before occurrence. And what they did is look at this big uh, EHR database um, and, uh, and identify almost 73,000 patients who had first episode psychosis followed by schizophrenia. And they paired those with patients who were psychosis free. Um, so this is supervised learning, right? Where you have your labeled data, you train your model on. And they trained their neural network on uh, data routinely collected in the EHR. And their model achieved a prognostic accuracy of 0.8. So almost in that excellent classification range. And that was in an external data set. So this study had the strength of being externally validated and also had the strength of achieving this classification performance using data routinely collected in the EHR, which is a bit of a drawback of some of these other studies just that you need to get imaging, genetic testing, et cetera, for them to, to uh, work well. 
And uh, one example of this is this 2021 study by Houtzelaris and others where they used machine learning to predict transition to psychosis for young adults at high risk or with recent on onset depression. And uh, they uh, followed participants for three years over which time 26 transitioned to psychosis. And they trained models on a, a lot of data. So clinical neurocognitive data, brain MRI data, genetic information. And then they incorporated clinicians prognostic estimates too, which is why they called it cybernetic, which I thought sounded very cool. Um, and their full combined model using all of these data had an area under the curve of 0.9. So squarely in that excellent classifier range compared to only 0.73 for, for humans. Um, and they found that humans optimism bias, our tendency to say, no, you're not going to transition to psychosis was reduced to from almost 40% to 15% by the model. So pretty cool, but uh, had the weaknesses of not being externally validated. The full combined model was not externally validated. They did run some um, external validation on uh, a couple of uh, individual models they trained on, um, on uh, individual pieces of, of the data, but not the full combined model. And this model needs um, data that's not routinely collected in order to make its its predictions. Uh, this group did release this model on the internet though, um, and are hoping that others will be able to externally validate it. So it'll be interesting to look for that. And then there's work on using brain MRI to detect Alzheimer's disease early. So in 2022, publishing in Nature Scientific Reports, Liu and others trained neural networks on labeled brain MRI scans, so again, supervised learning, to develop a model to detect Alzheimer's disease early. And they achieved an area under the curve of 0.85, uh, distinguishing between cognitively normal subjects and subjects with cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. And it was in an independent cohort, so um, this study does have the strength of being externally validated. Um, and I'll uh, move us along here for the sake of time. And then Apple is doing work on using data from Apple Watch and iPhone, including pretty sensitive things like facial expressions, typing, typed content, typing speed, et cetera, to, de to develop features they might be at risk of various psychiatric conditions. Um, so they're partnering with Biogen to detect mild cognitive impairment, partnering with UCLA to detect stress, anxiety, and depression, and with Duke to detect autism. So it'll be interesting to watch for these features coming out in the next few years. And then one of the most interesting studies I found was this 2016 study by Chakrut and others in the Lancet Psychiatry where they um, developed a machine learning model to predict who would respond to citalopram using data from a simple questionnaire that a patient can complete uh, in 10 minutes. So what they did is use patient-reported data from the first st stage of STAR-D where everyone was treated with citalopram to identify variables most predictive of treatment outcome. And then they trained a machine learning model to use those variables to predict who would remit from 12 weeks on citalopram. And this model achieved an accuracy of almost 60% and accuracy, so they didn't report an area under the curve here, they reported accuracy, which is a measure of how many true predictions do you make versus all the predictions you make. So true positive plus true negative divided by true positive, true negative, false positive, false negative. So an accuracy of 60% on external validation. Um, and uh, they did their external validation on a group treated with escitalopram. So presumably thought, okay, it's the S and antimer of citalopram probably um, similar, sim similar enough that we can call this external validation. And this accuracy of 60% is better than the fi almost 50% accuracy of psychiatrists trying to predict treatment outcome. And uh, they noted the model performed above chance in an external escitalopram bupropion group, but not in a venlafaxine mirtazapine group, which maybe suggests this model is actually saying something important about wh whose brain is going to respond to this specific uh, molecule um, um, and concluded their model more than doubles their confidence that a patient's going to respond to citalopram and uh, this could help conserve, uh, confer placebo benefits. So it does have the strengths of being externally validated, has the strength of uh, being able to perform using data a patient um, can give you in, in 10 minutes. Um, but this model was made proprietary. I was like, I want to try using this, but it was made proprietary and Dr. Chakrud co-founded a company called Spring Health in 2016, valued at $2 billion a couple of years ago. Um, and Spring Health advertises personalized mental health care for every employee with their precision approach to mental health. And they provide services to a lot of big companies, including Whole Foods. 
Um, so this model's proprietary and it hasn't been replicated um, yet. So it would be very, very interesting if someone can replicate it. So that's an overview of some things that are happening in the clinical prediction space in psychiatry. And now moving to applications of AI in psychotherapy. So one application uh, that a University of Washington professor, Dr. Dave Atkins, um, is heavily involved with is automated psychotherapy feedback. Um, and Dr. Atkins is the CEO and co-founder of this company called Listen, which aims to help clinicians organizations improve the quality of their services. And in 2019, Imel and others, including Dr. Atkins, showed feasibility of implementing a model for providing automated feedback for motivational interviewing. So helping people uh, train to become good motivational interviewers. So what they had done was previously train a speech processing and machine learning model on a set of uh, motivational interviewing sessions for substance abuse that had been transcribed and behaviorally coded. So supervised learning. Um, and, and then they had 21 therapists try this model out. And what this model does is take audio from your therapy session and then give you this feedback report on a computer, which gives you a rating for your overall fidelity to motivational interview principles, a rating for overall empathy, and then metrics like your reflections to questions ratio, your percent open, open questions, um, your percent talk time, some neat uh, figures like this. And they found that 83% of those therapists found the feedback consistent with their self-perceived performance and 90% were likely to use the feedback in their practice. So uh, interesting stuff. Um, and then Listen, Listen is also working on what for me would be the coolest thing um, that could come out of this AI space. And that would be an, a system to write my notes for me. So Listen advertises this product called Listen AI Notes, which you can find at this URL, which per the website generates accurate notes that are not simply a cut and paste from the transcript, but offer nuance and detail. And it says it can adapt to you by learning from your common edits. So sounds very interesting. I'd, I'd, I'd really like to try this out. Haven't, haven't tried it yet. And then Listen is also doing work on AI to assess fidelity to CBT and give you automated feedback on CBT. Automatically code psychotherapy sessions for emotional content and try to further the study of the role emotion plays in psychotherapy. And then uh, enhancing empathy of conversations and text-based mental health support by having an AI system generate suggestions that your uh, crisis text counselor can uh, send to the to the person seeking support, and there's some indication people find the AI generated uh, um, responses more empathic, et cetera, and, and uh, superior in certain ways, um, and uh, and more. And then there's work on using AI to maximize therapist efficiency. So I thought this was a really interesting study in 2022. Piet and others in JAMA Internal Medicine use an AI model to adjust the lengths of CBT sessions for chronic pain based on patient reported data about how they're doing. So what, what they did is randomize patients with chronic back pain to receive either 10 weeks of standard CBT for chronic pain delivered via telephone in 45 minute sessions, or to 10 weeks of CBT for chronic pain where they adjusted the length of the weekly visit um, according to the recommendation of the AI model. And they adjusted the length of the visit among three options, either a recorded voice message, a brief recorded voice message, message from the therapist, a 15 minute telephone session, or a 45 minute standard telephone session. And the AI model would adjust the session length based on daily feedback that the patient gives um, um, via voicemail about step counts, pain intensity, mood, et cetera. Um, and they found that the patients receiving the AI adjusted CBT sessions had non-inferior pain-related functioning outcomes at three months on the, their primary outcome, which was score on the, this disability questionnaire where lower scores represent lower levels of pain-related disability. Um, and they achieved this outcome with 30% of the clinician time required for the comparison group. So massive reduction in clinician time to achieve the same outcome. And then of course, there's virtual psychotherapy. Um, which has a long history in the AI space. Uh, the very first chatbot um, called Eliza, released in 1966, was programmed to simulate a Rogerian psychotherapist. And I thought this quote from, from a paper about Eliza was hilarious and slightly insulting, and, uh, but I think it was tongue in cheek. Um, so virtual psychotherapy 
obviously has some disadvantages, right? It's probably most applicable with manualized therapies. The computer is, you know, less able to identify comorbidities and shift treatment accordingly. Um, and of course, it's lacking the human element, um, which, you know, so many therapists, you know, I think rightly believe is so important for psychotherapy. Uh, there's this question of whether a compu computer can really provide any of the common factors that uh, that research, research is uh, and has shown are so important to psychotherapy. But virtual psychotherapy does have some advantages. It's um, easy to access. You just download an app. You don't. There's no wait time for it. It's easily scalable. You know, millions of people can download these apps. It's available 24/7. And there's some evidence users might be more open with the machine too. Um, 2014, Lucas and others found participants who thought they were interacting with the computer had lower fear of self-disclosure, lower impression management, so modulating how you be behave in order to try to come across a certain way, displayed their status more intensely, more willing to disclose. So maybe could have some advantages. And, uh, you know, there are these chatbots out there. One of the most popular is WISA, this app that includes a chatbot based on CBT, DBT, mindfulness, and MI principles. Um, and WISA also incorporates access to human counselors with master's degrees. They have a paid tier where you can access these humans too. Um, and they have 5 million users in 65 countries and uh, some solid data coming out uh, just last year when Leo and others, including UW professor, Dr. Patricia Arion, found that orthopedic patients with depression or anxiety who received a, a version of WISA that was tailored for chronic pain, had greater improvements in depression, pain, and physical functioning than patients who received usual care. And this WISA group also had greater, improve, greater improvement in physical function and comparable improvement in depression, anxiety, and pain compared with patients who received in-person psychological counseling. And it was based on this study that in, in 2022, the FDA granted WISA breakthrough device designation for patients with, with pain and depression or anxiety. There's also Wobot. Um, another another popular one, an app which includes a chatbot based on CBT, DBT, interpersonal psychotherapy. Um, and there has been some, some research done on its efficacy. So 2017, Patrick and others uh, conducted a non-blinded trial with 70 young adults who they randomized to receive either Wobot or an ebook about depression. And they did find that the Wobot group had significantly decreased a PHQ-9 scores after, after two weeks. So only a two week period, but and not the most robust decrease in PHQ-9 score, but um, was significant. Um, caveat with the study though, that it was funded by Wobot and the founder of Wobot was the, was the second author. And the, both the Wobot and the Weiser groups have been doing some research on whether you can get some of the psychotherapy common factors with um, a virtual interface, um, which there is some indication you might, might actually be able to. Um, you know, humans anthropomorphize things easily. Um, um, and in 2021, Darcy and others found that Wobot users form therapeutic bonds with, with Wobot uh, that are comparable to those formed with outpatient CBT um, therapists, um, at least as measured by this working alliance inventory bond subscale. So found that the Wobot group had a score of 3.8 on this five point scale compared to a score of four for people receiving outpatient CBT. However, this study was also funded by Wobot and conducted by Wobot employees. So be aware of that conflict of interest. So that's an overview of some applications of AI in psychiatry and um, moving on to a discussion of some challenges of, of uh, applying AI tools in psychiatry and in medicine. So one big challenge is that collecting data is hard. And Andrew Ng, an entre famous entrepreneur and AI educator, likens AI systems to a rocket ship where you need a huge engine and a lot of fuel. Um, and the rocket engine is the learning algorithm, um, but the fuel is the huge amount of data you need to feed to the algorithm for it to run. And this is especially tricky in psychiatry because many outcomes that we're interested in, things like transition to psychosis or suicide are really rare events. So just getting a, enough is, is really hard. Um, and then measurement-based care is not widely adopted. So, and our data are fragmented in many formats, including free texted notes. So our data can be especially non-computer friendly. Um, you know, natural language processing is starting to change the uh, computer friendliness of free text, but uh, still a challenge. And then just adding another layer of difficulty, 
you know, confidentiality and data security are always important considerations when you're collecting data. And then there's this question of usability. So you can, it's one thing to design a model that has good predictive performance, but it's another thing to, for that model to actually improve your day-to-day -day psychiatric practice. Um, and uh, so a lot of, a lot of uh, challenges here. One is that collecting the data you need to, to give to your model for it to generate its prediction might be impractical, depending on the model. And then more data are not necessarily helpful. I like this quote from Nassim Taleb, where he says, paying attention to the eye colors of the people around you when you cross the street can make you miss the big truck. So maybe it's possible we get so distracted by what this model is saying, feeding data to the model, that we miss the human connection from the person who's sitting across from us and miss something that's staring us in the face. And you know, have to ask, would, would your practice meaningfully change if you did start using this, this model? Like, um, you know, you feed, this model tells you this person's likely to transition to psychosis in a year. And what do you do with that? You know, maybe you schedule them for more frequent follow-up. You can make some lifestyle recommendations maybe, but you probably don't prophylactically start an antipsychotic, right? So another thing to think about, there is a trade-off between these simpler, faster, more explainable models and complex, slower, more accurate models. And then there are these issues of alignment and bias with AI. So the alignment issue is that a computer will do exactly what you tell it to do. So you have to be really careful what you tell it to do. And this is famously illustrated by this paperclip maximizer thought experiment, where you imagine an artificial general intelligence that, um, that has a lot, of, a lot of power and you, in, you direct it to, increase the, to uh, increase the number of paperclips in the world. And, and it does that. It turns the whole world into paperclip manufacturing facilities. It kills all humans and harvests their bodies for atoms to use to make paperclips. And so vividly illustrates how you have to be careful what you tell your AI system to do. And um, you can imagine how a model that's focused on one metric, maybe minimizing PHP-9 score, might not appropriately consider other important dimensions. Like maybe it's so laser focused on the PHP-9 score that it doesn't consider med medication side effects. Or maybe you direct your robot therapist to minimize the PHP-9 scores of its patients and it encourages people with higher scores to attempt suicide. Uh, so that's, that's a challenge. Um, another is that models are not neutral reflections of the world. They always encode any biases that are present in their training data. And it's really hard to eliminate bias from, from training data. But this problem is, uh, I think, vividly illustrated by this example from 2014, where Amazon started using machine learning system to, for hiring and quickly stopped using it when they realized they were no longer hiring women, since the system downgraded resumes that included any feminine gender language, um, since the majority of previously hired, hired engineers were men. So, you know, any biases that might be present right now in our, in our psychiatric practice, maybe underdiagnosis of ADHD in girls or overdiagnosis of schizophrenia in black men, these will be perpetuated forward by any model we, we build. Um, and I think clinician literacy is, uh, is going to be another big area of challenge because most of us don't have any formal background in AI or machine learning, right? But I think this is going to be an important space and I think AI will create some new roles and responsibilities for us. Um, one is critically appraising the machine learning literature, doing the best we can to try to assess if these um, models are things that would actually, should actually be part of our practice. Um, and I think it's gonna be important for us to do that to resist the temptation toward automation bias. Um, I could see how, I could imagine a future where we over rely on automated aids and decision support systems if we aren't literate about the, their proper place in our decision making process. And then I think we're going to be responsible for navigating shared decision making between ourselves, patients, and this new uh, decision maker, um, this new uh, um, this new entity that has an opinion about how things should go. Um, I think we're going to be responsible for explaining the role that any AI tools play in our decision making. And I think we're going to be asked to help patients navigate any publicly available AI tools. Like, hasn't happened to me yet, but I can imagine a patient asking me if they think they should use Weiss or Wobot for therapy. Um, I think ChatGPT and future um, and successors to ChatGPT are going to become a kind of WebMD on steroids. It's going to be important for us to be able to help patients navigate that. 
So if you are interested in diving into this more, there's this really nice machine learning uh, page on gemmanetwork.com, uh, which included this article that I found helpful for thinking about some of these things. All right, so in conclusion, um, I think AI is a big deal, but our jobs are safe for now. I haven't seen anything that's an imminent threat. You know, progress in this area is exponential, um, so we'll, we'll keep an eye out, but I think our jobs are safe for now. Um, most clinical prediction is not ready for prime time, but I think it's gonna be really interesting to watch the space, um, trying to keep a critical eye as you do so. And I think for most of us and people without background in machine learning, probably the most useful thing to look for is whether a model has been externally validated and ideally replicated, but um, look for external validation. And then measurement-based care helps fuel research in this area. So if you're interested in helping with fuel the AI, AI beast, like think about using some measurement-based care, maybe vice versa, depending on what you think. Um, and then I do think virtual psychotherapy has some advantages, almost certainly going to become more common as these language models improve and become more uh, human-like in various ways. And then AI products are already good enough to help with administrative tasks, could help you improve your efficiency in some ways. So yeah, maybe, maybe try using one. Here are my references. And yeah, thank you for your attention. And I would like to acknowledge Dr. Goss and Dr. Frizzell's help with uh, preparing this presentation, giving me reading material, et cetera. And, and uh, I'd like to open up it up to questions. about comments? Yeah, sounds great. Well, you know, back in high school, we had to read Brave New World. And this sounds suspiciously like it, although it has a very different flavor than the book had. But uh, I, I'm impressed with a couple of things. I mean, number one, in a, a study of the literature by Wampold back in 2015, fidelity to model showed the least influence on outcome relationship with the clinician showed the most um, improve, uh, relationship to improvement. So I get a little suspicious that, uh, you know, fidelity, fidelity is going to take the place of relationship, but I'm also reminded of Compassionomics, uh, which I read recently, uh, which talked about the key factor in, in treatment is the relationship. And, um, you know, how do you get a relationship with a machine? Although I guess lots of people already have those pretty prominently, but it, it just seems like the formula for some kind of sick world. Your comments, please. <laughs> yeah, I think I would agree with that. And I, I was specifically thinking of you when I uh, introduced the virtual psychotherapy and was, was uh, wanting to highlight that there are some disadvantages of it. Um, no, I, I totally agree with that. Um, there are some interesting examples out there of people developing relationships with computer systems. There's this app called Replica, where you can have a virtual friend. It's an app you can download on your phone. It's like this virtual friend. People get into like sexual relationships with, with, this, with this app. And um, there was this hullabaloo recently when I think the developer of the app like changed it in some way so people no longer had access to these replica virtual friends and and a lot of people were very upset about losing this person that they that they loved um which does sound a bit like we're already in uh, something of a dystopia person should be in quotes right <laughs> dr kwame that was an amazing presentation and uh, I'm so grateful you pull, pulled it all together. It's, uh, I had no idea uh, of these things. You opened a world. Uh, I guess I have a couple of comments. I've been playing with the chat GPT and uh, looking at some presentations I'm giving. I write this in and I say, you know, please uh, look at my grammar, the content, the conciseness and uh, meaning and improve it. It's amazing what it does, okay. What happened last night doing this, I was doing this, there was a word that they used that I didn't like. And uh, it, I thought, so I replaced the word with something I thought was more meaningful, but I had some self doubt then, you know, if this AI with all of this intelligence is thinking <laughs> this, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. So, so that was an interesting thing, but I actually 
yeah, I used my own judgment. I thought it was good. So that, so I thought that was interesting. The other piece, and I, this, I just wanted to uh, add to what Charlie is saying is the importance of relationships. So I'm, I'm just thinking of those moments where I have these, I guess, kind of magical moments when I'm with another human being working in, in my work. When I make a mistake, I flub up. I cause a, you know, I'm late. Uh, my medication I'm prescribing causes side effects, or I let them down in whatever way, or maybe I just missed, I dropped something. I did not, was not, I had an empathic failure. When I own it and share sadness and curiosity about what impact that had on them, and yet they still are with me, those are powerful. And I, I don't know that AI can can replicate that. Maybe, maybe there could be some subs, but I think we have good job security. And but I also think that there's great resource with AI. So thank you for sharing. I curious if you have any comments. Thanks. Oh yeah. Well, uh, thanks for those comments, Dr. Hines. Yeah. Like uh, um, there is there is. Uh, some more literature out there from the Wobot and the Wisa folks saying, you know, people, it seemed like people in the study talked about Wobot as their little buddy and seemed to perceive some sort of empathy coming from, from Wobot. So um, I think they do have, have these kinds of criticisms in mind. Um, but yeah, it's just so hard for me to see how I, I totally agree. I think the, the relationship is so important. Right. Thank you. Thank you. David, I was just going to say, I'd like to see how ChatGPT handles a panel of borderline patients. <laughs> <laughs> Where the information that's being inputted is completely irrelevant. <laughs> totally. So, that's I, there as far as like information actually meaning something, you know. Totally, totally. Yeah, I can't read between the lines at all. I think it's interesting. This is Dr. Billington uh, over in Boise, um, because yeah, especially with borderline, since that's my subspecialty, uh, mentalization, the thing that heals uh, attachment patterns is a practice skill. So I've daydreamed for years about um, if something like, you know, Alexa or something like that, some of the, like these chat bots could help individuals practice uh, Oh, awareness of parts of themselves in conversation in real time because mentalization completely disappears with enough emotion dysregulation. And so integrating essentially a learned language skill into this complex um, awareness of parts of self is a, a difficult thing. And I think that's what I get the most excited about when I hear your presentation is that there may be some very, um, although it has, it's, it, you know, it's not the same as human-human relationships, there is a space to practice this skill development that could have uh, very structured boundaries, uh, says my mind, and very known boundaries that might help with some of the vulnerability of that self-discovery. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm biased by my uh, specialty, but man, I would love to be able to practice um, with these sort of chatbots just to boost my own uh, areas of weakness in mentalization and emotion dysregulation or emotion regulation. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for the presentation. It's fascinating. Cool. Yeah. Th thanks, Dr. Billington. Um, yeah, that didn't occur to me, but could, maybe, maybe Listen could come out with a product that gives patients some feedback on uh, on a particular area, and you could design a chatbot that's integrated with a listen-like product that gives you a, some feedback on on how you did in this interpersonal interaction. You could practice interpersonal skills or or, or whatever. Hi, um, Dr. Brown here. I had one comment, and you know I love this Chat GPT and stayed up half the half the night playing with it when I first found out about it. But I think one thing we need to be um, concerned with is I, I want the I want the um, machine learning to replace the most drudgery, the, the most um, machine-like parts of my job. 
I think it's really dangerous to have it replace the most human um, like parts of my job, <laughs> the parts where I seem like a human. Here's one other thought experiment you can play with is we know 60% of the people that have a secure attachment. Do we want robots helping parent the other 40% of the children? Because you could easily write a program so you have an algorithm that helps those 40% of the parents that are having difficulty create um, secure attachments. And, you know, maybe there's a place for a certain advice, but just having the, why replace the, the most um, human parts of ourselves with the machine? I guess that's my concern. And we know that usually it's for monetary reasons. Yeah, yeah, like uh, WISA has this this paid tier, but the paid tier is for uh, access to to humans. Um, but yeah, so so my sense is that these um, systems, these chatbot therapists, should be used for very limited applications. And I do agree um, that our psychotherapist jobs are pretty safe, since so so like so many problems should really be dealt with with the the human the human relationship. Oh, I have I have not seen the movie Megan. I'll I'll have to watch it. I, I'm getting a lot of AI movie recommendations lately. All right, yeah. Thanks for thanks for all the comments, everyone. I'm just seeing these. Thanks for the heads up on this because we know it's coming on so fast. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to watch. And we should check out some of these UW professors that are doing interesting things. Yeah, it was surprising to hear how many. UW affiliated people were involved in this. I think Dr. Goss told me that a uh, psychologist with the Wobot team did a did a um, residency at Harborview. So even more than I had in my presentation. So quick one comment, if I might. Um, I was invited to participate by one of the doctors. I'm actually uh, an attorney as well as somebody who's pretty well versed in some AI applications and some of the background in terms of how the modeling is created. Um, so I think it, 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 it would be prudent to remind everybody in the group that really these models are predictive models. So when you're looking at something like chat GPT, these are really only anticipating what uh, uh, might be a response to a prompt, right? So um, they don't always get them right as you've already indicated. And there are only as good as the data that they are trained on. What I will also note, so uh, no, underlying that is really a need for very comprehensive, very deep data on particular subject matter areas, for example, testing of a particular compound or drug, treatment therapy, um, you know, what are preferred outcomes, and really uh, based on the hidden layers in the algorithms, these algorithms can find correlations between variables that are unanticipated, right? So we can get surprising outcomes um, with the data so long as it's good. So I think there's a really big need for a centralized public access database that allows people to really kind of um, play with models using the same database, data across all of these various models. Um, and, and really the outcomes will be spectacular, right? So the, the particular applications using chat GPT for note-taking and some of the automation pieces, those are just scratching the surface as, as to what is uh, available. So I'll give an example with AlphaGo. AlphaGo was one of the most complex games in the world. It's been played for hundreds and hundreds of years. And, you know, uh, 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 AI algorithms um, were trained with um, generative adversarial networks, they're called. And it's essentially one AI playing against another AI, and they are outmaneuvering each other um, on very fast compute times with 
essentially an infinite variety of potential moves. And so there's not a human being on the planet now that can beat an AI algorithm at chess or at Go, right? And these, these specific application models are being applied in many, many areas, and they're outpacing human beings without a doubt, okay? And there's no way, because the human brain just doesn't have the compute um, it doesn't learn the same way, but it's really dependent on the data that they're trained with, right? So um, I think uh, I think it would be naive to think that some of these models will not eventually be able to come up with predictive outcomes for all kinds of psych psychiatric use cases. And it's only it's only a matter of time. So one point one is 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 really kind of collaborating to create centralized data. And two is don't be naive about what these things can do, and and whether or not they're useful or not, that will depend on how we build the models to avoid bias, and how we can extend them to the particular application they're intended for. Because there's a lot of people out there that need mental health care that will never get access to it. And so just from a pure ethical standpoint, if you can create a model that delivers positive outcomes for people that wouldn't have access through a, through a modality that's accessible, I think that's a positive for the world. Yeah, I think this is such an exciting space, and I'm going to be so interested to see the developments here in the future. And thanks for those comments. All right, everyone, we're over our time. I'll uh, th thanks for your attention today. Take care. Thanks.